So far we've focused on pi systems containing an even number of carbon atoms. But we've seen examples, actually, of pi systems containing an odd number of carbon atoms already, most notably allylic systems containing three carbons. For example, the allylic cation is featured prominently in many SN1 reactions involving allylic halides or pseudohalides. This is a resonance stabilized cation that's easily formed under most SN1 reaction conditions. The allylic radical pops up in allylic halogenation with n bromosuccinamide. And although we haven't seen the allylic anion directly, one important point about the allylic anion is it's much more stable than, for example, the propyl anion with a single bond where we see this double bond. And so propene, the conjugate acid of this molecule, is relatively acidic. In this video, we're going to examine resonance forms of allylic systems, relate these to a molecular orbital picture for the allylic pi system, and connect the greater stability of allylic cations, anions, and radicals to observations in chemical reactions. The allylic pi system consists of three sp2 hybridized carbon atoms connected to one another in a linear arrangement. Each sp2 hybridized carbon atom bears an unhybridized p orbital, and these are the orbital building blocks of the allylic pi molecular orbitals. And so this is a delocalized three atom pi system. Allylic pi systems are often drawn with a dotted line like this to show the partial double bond character between the atoms involved. And one thing we're going to notice as we examine the allylic systems in this video is that the number of electrons is actually irrelevant to the orbital structure, at least in terms of shape. And so the cationic, anionic, and radical allylic systems actually share a lot of features in common when it comes to orbital shape. They differ most notably in their charge, of course, and the number of pi electrons appearing within the allylic pi orbitals. Let's look first at the allyl radical, which is a neutral structure containing three pi electrons, two associated with the double bond and one associated with the radical electron. There are two resonance structures of this molecule that differ in the location of the radical electron. And these illustrate that radical electron density is shared between the two terminal carbons, a general th theme we're going to see throughout this video. Because the allyl radical is a three-atom pi system, it has three pi molecular orbitals. The lowest energy pi mo, let's call it pi 1, is filled. The next one up, pi 2, is half filled. This is where the radical electron is located. And the highest energy orbital, let's call it pi 3, is empty. If we look at or the orbital shapes, we see a familiar pattern emerging. The lowest energy orbital is constructed from three n-phase p orbitals overlapping constructively, as we see here. In pi 2, we find a node sitting on the central carbon atom. That's why there's no orbital density here, and opposite phases on either end. Pi 2 is actually a really important orbital in all three of these cases, as we'll see. And in the case of the radical, this is referred to as the SOMO. It's the singly occupied molecular orbital that tells us a lot about the radical nature of this species. The main thing I want to draw your attention to here is that the locations of orbital density within pi 2, these outer two carbons, correspond to the locations where we find radical character in the resonance structures. That's not a coincidence. And this speaks to the connection again between the resonance picture and the pi molecular orbital picture. Where we find radical density is where we find lobes in the half-filled molecular orbital. Pi 3 is the LUMO of the allylic radical, and as we've seen before, this orbital comes from destructive interference between all adjacent pairs of atoms in an alternating phasing or shading pattern. If we add one electron to the allylic radical, we arrive at the allylic anion, which contains four pi electrons now. We still have three pi molecular orbitals here, because there are three atoms in the pi system. And now, the lowest energy orbital is still completely occupied. The next orbital up is also completely occupied. And pi 3, the highest energy orbital, is still empty. I've deliberately drawn these three levels higher in energy than the corresponding levels in allyl radical to illustrate an important point. The fact that this molecule has negative charge means that its orbital energies are higher across the board. The electrons are all higher in energy. Remember, electrons are negatively charged themselves than they would be in a related neutral molecule like allyl radical. Negative charge shifts up orbital energies. 
the shapes are actually identical to the shapes in the allo radical case. The one I want to focus on is pi 2. That's because this molecule is a nucleophile, or Lewis base, being negatively charged, and the orbital that really dictates the nucleophilicity that shows us how the molecule will behave as a nucleophile is the highest occupied molecular orbital, or HOMO. Notice here again, I can't emphasize this enough, the connection between the resonance picture, where we see negative charge within the resonance structures, and the molecular orbital picture, where we see orbital density in the highest occupied molecular orbital. These two things are related. The shape of the HOMO is telling us that the most reactive electrons are located on the terminal carbons, and in fact, the resonance structures are telling us the exact same thing. If we take an electron away from the allo radical, we arrive at the allo cation. The allo cation is a two electron pi system because this cationic carbon contributes no electrons to the pi system. It just bears an empty 2p orbital. Once again, because there are three atoms in the pi system, we have three molecular orbitals. And now pi 1 is still completely filled. Pi 2 is now completely empty since we've taken away that radical electron and pi 3 is still completely empty. I've deliberately drawn the orbital energies lower here since positive charge has the opposite effect on orbital energies as negative charge. In other words, positive charge shifts orbital energies down. A rough way to think about this is that because electrons are negative, a molecule with positive charge will attract electrons more strongly than, say, a neutral or anionic molecule, and so all the orbital energies get lowered. The orbital shapes here again are identical to the shapes in the allyl radical and anion case, but once again, the most important orbital in the allylic cation is pi 2. This is because it's the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO. The allyl cation is an electrophile, and so the lowest energy unfilled orbital is the most important orbital in this molecule when it comes to reactivity. Notice one more time. I just can't resist it one more time, the correspondence between the resonance picture, where positive charge is located in the resonance structures, and the molecular orbital picture, where we find orbital density in the LUMO. The shape of the LUMO shows us the sites within the molecule that are most prone to nucleophilic attack, approached by a nucleophile. In this particular case, it's the two outer carbons focusing on this shape. There's no orbital density on the central carbon, so we shouldn't expect nucleophilic attack at the central carbon. Of course, the resonance structures tell us the exact same thing. There's positive charge on the two outer carbons, and we should not expect nucleophilic attack at the central carbon, which is neutral in both resonance forms. Summing up, what we can say about the allylic pi system is that the shapes that you see on the right-hand side of this slide and the three orbital levels are characteristic of all of the allyl systems. But the number of pi electrons influences how the orbitals are occupied and indirectly the orbital energies by changing the charge of the molecule. Allylic cations, anions, and radicals are stabilized by resonance delocalization, an idea that we've seen many times before. This makes allylic species more stable than comparable alkyl counterparts like propyl cation, propyl radical, and propyl anion. And this makes allylic intermediates easily accessible in certain types of organic reactions, many of which we've seen before. For instance, the allyl radical figures prominently into allylic halogenation with NBS. A molecule like propene actually contains a few different types of hydrogens that could be abstracted in the course of a radical halogenation reaction with the NBS reagent. However, the allylic position reacts selectively because this reaction involves a radical intermediate. In thinking about the allyl anion, one thing to notice is that the pKa of propene at this methyl carbon is significantly lower than we would expect for a plain vanilla alkane. Something like propane at one of its terminal hydrogens has a pKa that's considerably higher, something like 50. This makes propane considerably less acidic than propene. And the ultimate reason for this is that deprotonation of propene generates allyl anion, the structure up here. Because its conjugate base is more stable than the conjugate base of propane, propene is more easily protonated and is more acidic. Finally, allyl cation figures prominently into nucleophilic substitution reactions involving allyl electrophiles with weak nucleophiles, which proceed through SN1. At first glance, this seems odd, since an alkyl analog, something like propyl bromide, 
does not react in SN1 at all. We might expect the same result for something like this, since it appears that the cation that would have to be generated here would be primary. However, this SN1 substitution reaction occurs rapidly because of the resonance stabilization of the allylic cation. 